Hello there. Hey, what a shirt. How's it going, brother? The reporting for duty. <laughs> Ed, coming to us from Phoenix. How you doing, nope. brother? Oh, no, no, no. I'm coming from you in the beautiful high, high desert of Winslow, Arizona, where I am on my five-acre compound. Yes, yes. Beautiful, beautiful. So I've, for been, me, and, I've, been pretty much, I've been secluded here since January, other than a couple of forays back into Phoenix and your wedding. I'm sorry at the wedding. So the wedding in May, I didn't realize you had been at your yes, homestead sir. since January. So, but yes, obviously sir. this is by choice. You you still have the home in Phoenix, right? Uh, well, my wife was ready to retire, and we had moved out of a three bedroom, two bath house with a pool. So I found her a little apartment across the street from where she works, and she's there, and I'm here. Are you looking to come together to retire there? Well, it depends on whether she likes it here when she visits or not. You know, <laughs> I have to I have to feather my nest well enough that the that the bower will look nice and, and she'll want to stay here. I'll tell you what, uh, I've got the most gorgeous weather. I've got the biggest sky. I've got wonderful, wonderful. Just it's it's all of that. A bag of chips and pickles, some ice cream and and a BJ. Ooh, <laughs> I'm telling you. This place up here is just fantastic. It really is. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have, a, so, I, have a, I have a national park that's 10 miles from me that's got a big, huge lake, and it's got canyons running on either side of me. There's, I don't have a downside other than the road in and out is so rocky that I can't, I, you know, you got you to gotta have a decent vehicle to get in here. Uh, I've almost got it to the point where somebody can drive in a car. When I get to that point, then I got to widen it out so that a big, big vehicle can go on it. And then, then it's all over but the shouting. Well, you know, Ed, one of the things that I realized about the Garden of Freedom and, and this community out here, and I assume it's it obviously similar with yours in this regard, you know, we, we say, well, well for, for us, I live down three miles of private dirt road. And you could get here with a car if you drove slowly. You know, you wouldn't right. want oh, a yeah. low rider, right? Yeah. But right. if you drove really slow, you could get out here with a regular sedan. And, you know, one of the things that, that we talk about as libertarians, right, is when seconds count, the police are just minutes away. And out here... How long would it take the cops to reach your place? Yeah, there you go, Ed. Self-defense, absolutely. But how, how long would it take? If you called the cops in an emergency to get to your place, how long would it take them to get there? Uh, well, I had an interaction with the county sheriffs and they gps my front door. So I don't know if it was a real emergency, maybe 15, 20 minutes. All right. So they're not, but they're not intervening. They're not a presence out there. They're not a rapid response force of any kind. And they, what this. They come out for complaints. Right, I had, right. I had, a neighbor had a tent stolen. And somebody pointed in my direction. So I had a sheriff show up one time and ask me about it. And I, I looked at my little shotgun shack structure and I looked back at him and I said, sir, I don't think I need a tent. Uh, and he laughed and said, no, of course you don't. You're not the person we're looking for. And he left. So Nice, you know. nice. Yeah, and that's, that's another uh, you know interesting thing out here, too, is that when a cop comes out here, how far away is their backup? 20 minutes. <laughs> They're a lot more polite, aren't they? They're interactive, let's say respectful in a way that they might not be in metropolitan phoenix they're humans they're humans and they know they're dealing with humans i mean there might be criminals amongst the humans but they have discernment just like you and i and and we're all people up here i mean when you get out in the middle of nowhere and everybody's armed then an armed society is a polite society and we're just polite with each other and we take care of business and it's done Exactly. And that's get, that's that's exactly getting to my point here, Ed. And I want to know what you think about this, because, uh, like I said, as libertarians, we like to make the point 
that police don't ever really intervene or very rarely intervene in crimes in progress in a way that's prevented. Like, you know, I, I was arguing about uh, is the Constitution good or bad for freedom in the in the U.S.? And, and the guy I was debating was trying to make the case uh, about rape and rapists. And we need government to protect vulnerable women from rapists so they can feel safe walking to work and, and down the you know, city streets at night. And you go, well, are those women who are afraid carrying cops in their purses or pepper spray? You know, really, which is it? And when you go to make the point that, that we do as libertarians, like, no, police don't have any effect. It's If anything, it's negligible, right? A negligible effect on politeness, on well, the, civility. The basic, the basic problem is, is that most people in society live on the false premise that they are in a secure state where they are not. They are not in it. Nobody in the United States of America today lives in a secure state. I can instead, prove that. Right, I can instead. prove that. It's, it states clearly in the Second Amendment that a well-regulated militia being required for a free state, et cetera, et cetera, says right there, in order to have a free state, you have to have a well-regulated militia. We do not have a well-regulated militia. We have an unorganized militia that may, may well be self, well self-regulated, but they aren't regulated with each other yet. That time is going to come soon when, when they regulate each other. Because when the bullets start flying, then the good guys gather together and communicate. Right. And instead of having real security, most Americans just shield themselves with the warm, comforting, false security blanket of government propaganda that says we're taking care of you and you're going to be okay. Here's, here's the bigger point, though, Ed, is that when we talk about getting government out of the business of public safety and dealing with criminals and bad actors, we often lack examples. And yet here we have a very clear-cut case just looking at urban America versus rural America. Do we have rampant crime and murders and thefts and assaults out here in in, in our homestead communities? We no. don't know. We, we no, don't. you can't say no. Wait a second. You can't say no because there is no proper reporting of the facts. Whether you're in a rural or urban or city sector, you know, it doesn't matter where you're living, you're not getting the proper facts. For 25 okay. years, for 25 years, I monitored the Phoenix Police Dispatch channel on my radio. And I knew what was going on. I knew what happened. And the only thing that made it on the main, the lamestream media news was those occurrences that were witnessed by the public. If it wasn't witnessed by the public, it didn't make it on the news. It happened, but nobody knows, knows it happened. It could have happened next door or across the street, and they still wouldn't have known it unless somebody was there and saw it. If somebody was there and saw it, then it might get publicized. The more people that saw it, the more it gets publicized. I know that for a fact. Monitoring the police saved my life many, many times. I drove a cab for, for decades. Drove a cab for a long time. And there was times where I dropped somebody off and I'm going in the direction, you know, just I'm driving. And I hear that there's, you know, three perpetrators on the road that I'm on just ahead of me that have try, attempted to carjack somebody. And I did a U-turn and went the other way. It saved my life because I was informed properly, okay? There's so many things that have gone on in the world since they shut down our ability to monitor them, which was basically going from analog to digital. Because when it was analog and it was transmitted, I had a crystal radio. 
okay, with their frequency. And I knew where they were, I knew what they were saying. They didn't like that. So they went to digital. Then there's applications that they had for a while there where you could monitor them. And then those applications went away, okay, to where you can't monitor them anymore. Well, we don't want the bad guys to know we're coming. It's like, yeah, always make something up to cover your butt, okay? Well, Oh, we could talk for days, buddy. Well, I miss. Yeah, I want to. I, I miss you know, so much. <laughs> yeah, no, you. Go ahead. You always chat ahead. like I. I've never had a conversation with you that I wasn't challenged in some way. But if I mean, I want to get back to my main point here and and right. and put it to you as a question, right? Because uh, I, I may have overstated my case, as you have pointed out, and that I can't say for certain that I know these things, but I do know for a fact that I don't miss being close to the police out here. I know for a fact that most of my neighbors feel the same way. I know for a fact that most people out here are respectful of individual rights, property rights, natural law, and take responsibility for their own security. And if that, what conclusion then would if, if if I'm overstating my case now sidebar if I may of course and we we have to recognize that when we talk about criminality in this sense we're 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 sort of separating private criminal organizations and individuals from government criminal organizations and individuals so I mean right away we know that we come out here we have less crime because we're less likely to get arrested for drug possession, for example, right? And to get arrested for drug possession or to arrest someone for drug possession as a cop is a crime. To collect taxes, to steal from someone is a crime. And there's a lot less of that out here. But then, Ed, I would, I would put it to you. How would you use this scenario, this, this observation or series of observations here to make the point to a status that cops don't really help you in terms of your personal security in any meaningful way that you couldn't do better for yourself. I have used the cops pretty much all my life as the cleanup crew. That's what I've treated them. That was their job was to clean up the messes. That's pretty much what they've done for me all my life. I've never feared the police. I've had many, many interactions with them, and we could go out two shows just on the interactions I've had with police, you know. But I don't fear them. I used them properly when I needed to. Um, I might have had one or two adverse altercations with them, but nothing that really mattered that much. Um, I'm out here in the middle of nowhere. Right. But somebody purchased some a plot of land out here, maybe 1,500, 2,000 yards from me. And they showed up on the weekend, you know, with their with their family in a tent. And then you come back a couple of weekends later and started building and ended up building something that looked like just a, a square box made out of plywood. And then there was. A lot of weird traffic at night, in and out of there, almost like it was being used as a drop station. And then I got the the thing about the cop that the the sheriff that came out about the missing tent. Well, the missing tent came. The guy that built that thing said his tent was missing. I don't know. The the cop left later that day, and I mean that's the first the first officer or anything I've I'd seen. You know that was. That was, I think, in May. I hadn't seen anybody out here as a first. I was shocked when I hear, uh, you know, sheriff's office. Like, Sh what the hell is a sheriff's office doing hold here? Hold on, hold on a second, Ed. If you oh. have a door that a sheriff can walk up to and knock on, you're probably not doing it right. I got a fence long ways away from my front door with no trespassing sign. Well, he, he went past the tr no trespassing sign to come up to my door. Do you have a, do you have a gate? Yeah, fence no, I don't have a gate. A ga I got five acres, buddy. I've only been here since 
January. The six months before that, I spent 35,000 miles between Phoenix and here bringing everything up here. Okay. I haven't had a chance to put up any fences or anything like that. No. That's Anybody can walk true. up and take whatever the hell they want, walk away. And I wouldn't know it if I wasn't here. That's why it was one of the first things we did here in Gardenia was put up a fence. And if you want, maybe I can help you build a, a beautiful four strand barbed wire like we have here. Well, I, I have enough tea stakes. And if I want to buy barbed wire and put it up, that barbed wire is not going to stop nobody. It's not going to do nothing. Uh, well, yes and no, Ed. You know, obviously, if someone under, has made you a target and says, I'm going after Ed bringing you know a couple snips and cutting out your barbed wire yeah not a big deal you're, not a real you're, you're in a place way. you're in a place that takes a road to get to i'm in a place that you have to make your own road to get to and that's a better that's better security i suppose but it's for the people I can, wandering I can through see you know? somebody coming i can see somebody coming from two miles because there's no trees here no uh. trees I can see somebody coming for two miles. I was just working away and doing my thing. I wasn't looking at the, the you know, looking at the horizon. Is anybody coming? Is anybody coming? If I did that, I'd be just a paranoid ditz. I would. Yeah. I'd be standing on my roof all day just doing circles, just doing circles. No, I don't see anybody. It's the only person I've seen come out here other than my own next door neighbor. That's it. But anyway, back to this thing where this guy built this thing and it looked like it was being used as a drop house. Well, the sh cop shows up and says the tent's missing. I don't know about nothing about no tent. Okay, no problem. Six o'clock that evening, I go walking outside and go to turn the corner. I look over and this place is on fire. It's pfft, It goes up inside of six minutes and burns flat to the ground. I don't know if there's somebody in it. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I don't know anything, but I got to call the county sheriffs. Hey, man, my neighbor's on fire. You know, you, you ain't going to get here in time to put it out, but you need to get here. Somebody needs to come. So they show up and everything, and I, I don't see how they got a fire truck there. I really don't. It was amazing. It's a different road to get to that section over there than it is to get to mine. It must be an easier road because they got a fire truck out there to put out the smoldering parts. And then afterwards, when I talked to the sheriffs, they come back by and they said, yeah, it was, it, it's a crime scene. Don't go over there. It's a crime scene. It was an arson. We found uh, accelerant on unburned wood and a flaming gas can. So I don't know if the guy was done with his with his drop house and torched it and left. I don't know if he was not supposed to be there and made an illegal door, you know drop house in the middle. No, all I know is I slept with my shotgun for a week. You know, just making making damn sure it's right here. I mean, I got you know what kind of ammo and and guns and shit I got. I mean. 13 calibers and guns to shoot them all. I'm ready, but <laughs> you got to see them coming. <laughs> yeah, be right. yeah, right. So, yeah, that's that's why, you know, I like having the fence here. It's really just the deterrent from, you know, random tweakers, ATV punks who come out here sometimes to tear things up. Uh, yeah, I, don't, you know, I, don't thing, thing. I don't have any of that. The ATVers, they come out maybe once a month and they stick to the really rough roads out there than my desert. I mean, but it, you need to come over, man. I've been to your place. You need to come on, come to my house and spend the night, have dinner. You know, I got a place for you to sleep. No problem. You know, or, or just come check it out for the day. Bring the wife, you know? All right. She's yeah, let's do it. Fantastic Absolutely. lady. I, I, I have not gotten a chance to stop and talk, you know, sit and talk with her, but if you guys come out for dinner you know, we'll do something nice and sit and talk in the in the beautiful breeze and and you know, love to say, love to have you. Awesome, yeah. Text me after this and we'll schedule it. Ed, just to wrap things up, what are your favorite parts about homesteading and living so rural? My cat, um, nature, nature. I mean, you you know my seeds. I mean, I've got so many seeds. I haven't planted hardly any of them yet. I got plenty of seeds, but I'm, I'm into nature and gardening and all that. Watching the plants grow, seeing, watching the rabbits. I'm, the rabbits are my friends. I feel like Radagast out here. I swear. Cause I walk around and I talk with the rabbits and they come by me and I'm, you know, and they don't run or nothing. The, the lizards, the, just everything. It's just, it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. I mean, the opportunities I'm, I'm just every day is un unfolding opportunities.
Every day is opportunities unfolding. Every day. You know, I'm just, I'm glad for the COVID-19 and all this BS scare because it gives them something to do other than coming to me and saying, do you have an occupancy permit? <laughs> yep. I'm going to say, where's your mask, motherfucker? Okay. Uh, I'm tempted to put a sign out there next to the, to the no trespassing sign that says, this is a quarantine area. Do not uh, enter. Yeah, it's another silver lining of coronaphobia. You can use it to your. I hadn't that hadn't even occurred to me is that you can use it in a defensive way. And you know what? Uh, if you live in a city, I don't think it would be. You know, I mean, it couldn't hurt to if, if you're worried about police oh, no, no, coming no. into you, your. If you're in a city with millions of people, no stamp you right now oh look at that guy well let's go get him and drag him out of his house and go quarantine him somewhere yeah that's true you have a greater oh, risk if you uh, if you identify yourself as a house where individuals have been infected yeah but you can put a notice on the door that says like you know we are we are you can put a notice on the door that says we have immunocompromised people here do not enter we're, we're right in self-isolation yeah right there's other ways to, to apply that Use their weasel words against them every time, you know, every yes. chance you get, use their weasel words against them. There's yes. a lot of things that have crumbled and destroyed that I don't want to come back. Okay. When, when I saw some report about, you know, well, 282,000 non-essential government employees have been furloughed. It's like, well, if they're not essential, they shouldn't have been there to start with. Ta -da! <laughs> but, you know, common, common sense has got me thrown out of too many places. Uh, well, and I think the sign that, that we might be adding here at Gardenia is just leave this long-haired country boy alone. Won't stop. And thanks so much for joining us and talking about homesteading today. Hey, you know, you, you, I had to jump through a lot of hoops to get on here. And plus, you're now being streamed on the Psychic Taxi channel when I'm here. So, All right. Hey, yeah, any plugs? Psychic Taxi is Ed's handle online across the board. Any any yep, platform that people can find you on? Psychic Taxi at yahoo.com, at, at uh, YouTube, Twitter, you name it. If it's Psychic Taxi, it's this guy here. Beautiful. Thanks so much, brother.